Okay. All right, Zozer just joined too. Okay. So. All right, all right. Peace and love, y'all. Peace all right, love. peace and love, family. Yeah, man. Uh, is anybody else coming in? Okay, there goes somebody. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, that Zosa. was Brother Zozer. Mm-hmm. From South Carolina. Yeah, peace and love. All back. Mm-hmm. All right, who back? We're all back. Yeah, let me know, uh, Bertarian, when you're ready, ready for me to drop. Okay, to Go ahead. To Hootie just joined, too. To Hootie okay, to Hootie. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Peace and love, y'all. Peace and blessings. I'm Toriano over Sean Gawell, and uh, I was invited on the call, man, as a, a guest to explain some things to you. And uh, Brother Terry asked me to explain uh, so many words, uh, you sanguinous, you solely, importance of DNA, archaeology, anthropology, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, what they call it, uh, uh, cranial morphology, things of that nature in regards to the original groups of people or the first group of people that populated the Americas and the, the succeeding uh, successive groups thereafter. And uh, you so lead as it deals with the first uh, land claim in regards to uh, imperial history and colonization of the Americas. So uh, everything that I give or will say can be easily verified and researched, uh, scientific fact, uh, uh, things of that nature, so therefore, you know, you can help. It'll help you to make an informed decision about this movement that's uh, dealing with the Moors and whatnot and how to uh, have status and standing in accordance with law and not only that, the international community because they've already spoken on our behalf in regards to uh, our status and standing on the land and it's in the American Declaration of the rights of indigenous peoples by the Organization of American States and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So uh, if you have any questions, you know, uh, I, that's really what I like to uh, build off of. And so whatever questions you may have, you know, uh, ask your questions, and uh, I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Okay, okay. Hey, this is uh, Brother Mudhutha uh, Toriano. Um, hey, man, glad to have you on the show. I'm glad you came. Um, Brother uh, Tedamoon Tyrion has been really bigging you up, man. He's He said, man, he could tie us all the way back into, like, Hannibal. And I'm like, right? Brother Tedamoon, out of, out of, out of, out of uh, Maryland? No, no. Well, that's, well Tyrion, that's, uh, that's his new Wabic name. Oh, 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 okay, 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 yeah. okay. Oh, I'm so, yeah. Turn, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. My bad. I didn't mean to confuse anybody. <clears throat> oh, okay. okay. But I was, but I was kind of wondering. You were mentioning, uh, uh, I think you said craniology, which has to do with the skull, right? Yeah, cranial um, morphology. Mm-hmm. Cranial morphology. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, how are you using that to kind of tie us into the Americas here? And then, I guess my second question would be. After you, how are you using cranial morphology to also tie us into our families, like our direct line, like our grandmothers, great grandmothers, great grandfathers? How does that all tie in? Because I find that very interesting. Well, as far as your direct descent, uh, as far as by the skull, I can't tie you in like that. But okay. with cranial morphology, they can tell by the uh, measurement of the skull, the shape of the skull. You have quite a few skull shapes. You have uh, dolicocephalic, which means long head, long shaped skull. You have what's called mesocephalic, which is the skull is not as long. And then uh, that's where most of us are, mesocephalic. 
and you have what's called brachycephalic. Brachycephalic is the skull, the shorter the skull case is shorter, and the facial aspect of the of the skull is wider. Now mesocephalic, I mean brachycephalic, you find that more along the lines of so called quote unquote Africans, uh Australoids, uh people of that nature. And mesocephalic is like a combination of those people mixed in with what they call the proto-mongoloid or the mongoloid population because most of them are brachycephalic. They have short skull cases and very wide faces. And when you look at these skulls because of uh, anthropology, archaeology, and you go basically, man, digging around in other parts of the world, you can pretty much see that, hey, this right here, this skull is particular, or this skull shape is particular to group A found in this part of the globe. Uh, this skull shape is more particular to group B, things of that nature. Not only that, uh, dental structure plays a part in that too. Like a lot of proto-mongoloids have what's called shovel teeth, where they're... Uh, their incisors are shaped like a shovel. It has a, a, a bold look, and on the back of the tooth, it's kind of hollowed out like a shovel. When you dig down in the ground, mm-hmm. you find that coming amongst a lot of uh, mongoloids and those uh, red Indians who I'm not talking about the Europeans, the $5 Indians, but I'm talking about the ones of mongoloid descent. Mm-hmm. And you find that coming amongst a lot of us too over here in the America, you don't find it too much in Africa. As a matter of fact, there's only a few groups that may carry it, like the Igbo. The Igbo people in Nigeria, shovel tooth is found amongst them. And uh, there's another group, I think, out of Ghana that is found too. But that trait is not an African trait. And so it's more along the lines of uh, uh, Siberian, East Asian, and whatnot. So if you find it in us as well as those people in uh, Asia, then that shows you that there was some uh, admixture or genetic introgression a long time ago, many, 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 many years ago, mm-hmm. for that dental trait okay, to show up in us. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And yeah. when you're dealing with, uh, not only that, when you're dealing with uh, the skull, uh, the brachycephalic is also found amongst the Southeast Asians and uh, quote-unquote Austronesian people like Melanesians and the Atas of uh, the, the, the land they call the Philippines, uh, the Orygosli Mele uh, of the land that they call Malaysia, uh, the uh, Andaman Islanders, Jarawa, uh, the Mons of Southeast Asia, like Cambodia and Vietnam and all of that, all up in that area. Mm-hmm. So when you go and start doing the genetics of these people, now this is where it gets very interesting. Populations have... Uh, ancestral informative or ancestry informative markers, which are known in science as uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And what happens is how single nucleotide polymorphisms come about is mutations in the DNA due to environmental pressures or adaptation of your environment. And it normally takes thousands and thousands and thousands of years for this, these type of micro mutations to form in the genetic because of slow ad- slow adaptation to the environment and how it's passed on to the next generation is called natural selection. So if you got a people that's been in a specific a specific area, let's say fifty, sixty thousand years, mm-hmm. you know, and slowly their bodies start to adapt to their environment. Why? Because of the food you eat. Everything you put into your body is a chemical. Everything is a chemical. It's a chemical first and foremost. Why? 
because it's made up of the periodic table. So certain areas, they may have more uh, calcium in their food. Some of them may have more uh, potassium. Some may have more of this. Some may have more of that. And over the thousands of years, and plus the water, the water may come from a source that's mineral rich. You know, certain minerals higher in that body of water than there are in other places around the globe. And then not only that, the sunlight. The sunlight in and of itself, man, plays a part in it as well because as it reacts on the skin, it causes a chemical reaction. So all of these things go into a person's genetic mutation that creates the micro mutations in their genes that are akin to their specific region of where they have been for thousands of years. And then these mutations are passed on from generation to generation to generation until they finally culminate into what's called a specific ancestry informative marker that is uh, specific to those peoples of that given geographical region from the effects, the effects of the environment uh, that has uh, taken place upon them for thousands of years. And so when these people start migrating, they carry these ancestry informative markers with them. And as they go into other lands and they start mixing with other peoples, what's known as genetic introgression or admixture, they pass on that specific genetic information to their offspring, no matter who they may mix with. So that's how cranial morphology plays a part in uh, population around the globe. Going into genetics, going into migrations, going into genetic introgression or admixture, going into passing on that genetic information, that genetic code to the next uh, offspring or population. Wow, man, you said a mouthful there. Uh, that, yeah, that was fascinating. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Some good information right there. When you said that when a group of people grow up in a certain area and mm-hmm. you said the environment, you know, like the water, the, the food that you eat, you said that creates a, a certain genetic, um, a certain gene mm-hmm. kind of spawned forth from that. Uh, what, what, you know, what do scientists call that when you have a specific gene to a, that relates to people in a certain area and then that gene is passed on? I'm guessing they use that gene to kind of trace you back. Yes, it's called single nucleotide polymorphism. Oh, okay. I'm gonna have to, <laughs> I'm gonna have to look that up. Okay, all right. Absolutely, absolutely. And it comes about. It's not overnight. It's an ad- it's an adaptation over time that causes the, the gene to mutate. Because nature nature is always looking to improve on itself. That's why we adapt. If if nature was not built to improve upon them, upon itself, a lot of us would have died because it won't give you a perfect example. At one point in time, malaria was bad throughout the entire Americas, from north to south. And the first uh, known uh, place for malaria to actually be found was here in the Americas. It was found in a mosquito trapped in some amber, and it was about maybe 10 to 15 million years ago, somewhere up in there. And malaria is called by, caused by P. vivax. P. vivax is, is, is a, a, I think either a bacteria, I think it's a bacteria, a virus, something like that. Don't quote me, but P. vivax. P. vivax is the entity that's responsible for malaria. And the oldest place it was found was here in the Americas. Now, we do know that we've been present in the Americas for millions of years. And I'm not just talking about just saying, you know, we've been here for millions of years, like a lot of these other Moors are saying, you know, Terrell, no one that I'm talking about, you know, she always speaking this stuff, but you ain't got no facts. You have no proof. Mm-hmm. No. If you go down to South America, there was a man named uh, 
Florentino Amagino, and he had a brother named Carlos Amagino. And this was back in the 1800s. They was doing archaeology down in Argentina. And what they found was uh, anatomically modern human bones, remains. Anatomically modern human means we're not talking about uh, a bipedal hominid, hominid or upright walking form of man. No, we're talking anatomically modern human, just like you and I today. And they found, I want to say, the atlas bone of one that was 3.59 million years old, and they found a fully human fossilized jaw fragment that was dated at 5 million years old. And they also found tools. They found uh, spear tips. All of this stuff was five, five plus million years old, showing you that there was a presence of human activity as well as a human population going on back then that far. And what they did was uh, when they was digging into the earth, they had dug down to a certain level, and each level has a time frame of when it formed. And that's when they had found a lot of these relics and human remains between 3.5 and 5 million years ago. They found older sites of where there was human activity going on that was about 14 million years old, 14 million years ago. So all of this shows that there was a human presence, anatomically modern human presence, here in the Americas, and I got evidence of some that's even older than that, but we'll just stick right now to this. Mm-hmm. So if malaria was in the Americas 10 to 15 million years ago, 10 to 15 million years ago, and human presence or human activity was here, you know, roughly that same time. Well, the way malaria operates is if you catch it, either you survive or you die. Those who did have malaria back in that time frame and didn't die from it, caught it and didn't die from it, and had, because you know your body, your, 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 your body bills was called antibodies and things of that nature naturally, to try to fight off illness and disease. Now you go into a process of what's known as natural selection. Let's say a man caught it, he didn't die. His brother might have died, but he didn't die. A woman caught it, she didn't die. A mother might have caught it and died, but she didn't die. Both of those two come together, and they have a child. That child will have in his system it was genetic makeup, the natural antibody that caused both his mother and his father not to die from malaria. And then it goes on to have a child with somebody who caught it but didn't die. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Right. And this is what's called environmental pressures. What are the environmental pressures? Malaria. What is the natural selection? The ones who didn't die from it. What is the adapt- adaptation? the offspring who now carries that within his genetics. Yeah that's, that, yeah, that's amazing, man. That's amazing that how the body does adapt to, you know, environments and, uh, and finds a way, like you said, through natural selection to, to survive. Yeah. 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 Yep, that's why they kept saying in the movie Jurassic Park, uh, I think all the dinosaurs were female. Oh, and and then the the reproducing. Yeah, I remember this part. And then next thing you know, the guy saw little baby footprints of a dinosaur, meaning one of them had changed his sex to a male, just like lizards do. Some lizards have that capability. They thought they had written it out of the genetic code of the dinosaurs when they cloned it, but they didn't. And the guy said his famous words was, nature always finds a way. Mm-hmm. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, it's always looking to improve upon itself. It's a progressive 
It's a progressive law, progressive law of the universe. It constantly is always looking to improve on itself. All right. So with these ancestry informative markers, and you go into the DNA, then through single nucleotide polymorphisms that are population specific, those that are population specific, you can tell where those specific ones came from. Why? Because they've been charted in that population. So at some point in time, for these to end up in, quote, unquote, African-American people that they brought over from, quote, unquote, Africa, on the bottom of a boat, how did these end up in our genetic makeup? You understand what I'm saying? The only way they could have ended up in our genetic makeup is through genetic introgression, i.e. admixture. That's it. And it's known historically in archaeology, archaeologically that the people of the Pacific, now what I'm going to tell you, it may blow your mind. Mm-hmm. The people of the Pacific have a maritime history that goes all the way back to 900,000 years ago. The Shang Dynasty? No. Shang Dynasty wasn't even nowhere in, 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 in the imagination of men. So how, so, no. so, oh, let, me, let, let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. You said how long ago that was, the Orion of Benoville? I said the people of the Pacific have You're a maritime the, islands, right? the, the lands out in the Pacific, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea. Oh, oh okay, okay, okay. Yeah. All of those places. Mm-hmm. Australia. They have a history of maritime activity 900,000 years ago. You go and research okay. it. I have it in the one drive. It's called Ancient Maritime Activity. The Flores Islands is about 11 miles off the coast of Indonesia. Okay? And you can't swim there. It had activity, it had human activity on there that dated back roughly to 900,000 years ago. Ah! Yeah, that's, that's the amazing. Old, the only way you could get there back then because the Flores Islands was not connected to the mainland of Indonesia. Indonesia is right next door to Papua, New Guinea. It's right next door to New Guinea. Mm-hmm. The only way you could get there is by seafaring. So if those people have a seafaring history of 900,000 years ago, we know that there are currents in the Pacific Ocean, just like it is in the Atlantic Ocean, that will take you to various places. All you got to do is put your boat in the water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did we get Pacific DNA in our autosomal makeup? Those people had to have sailed here thousands of years ago. And they mixed in with the original population. Just like the Northeastern Siberian proto mongoloids the dark-skinned people, they got the straight hair, but they, they look Asiatic like the Chinese, but they're the original people of Asia, black as hell, dark as hell. Mm-hmm. How did we get their autosomal makeup into our genetic ancestry? You understand what I'm saying? So very people that they're calling African-American cannot be African in the sense of how they said they brought us over here in a boat. You know why? Tell them. Because, quote, unquote, according to them, when you was brought into the dock, that was a controlled environment. You were auctioned off. You was brought to a plantation. <clears throat> you was either forced to breed or forced to work until you died. Most of these other groups, the proto-mongoloids never ventured or migrated too far 
down south. Follow me where I'm going with this. The Melanesians and Austronesians never ventured or migrated too far down south in a quote-unquote the recorded time of post-Columbian history. What that means is there was already a population of people here that phenotypically looked like what you call, quote-unquote, African, tall, stocky, robust, deeply melanated. That that was here first and foremost, along with the Australoids, the people of Australia, because we carry, some of us carry their gene pool, I do. The people that they call Australian Aborigine, I carry their gene pool, as well as the Austronesian, Melanesian, and the people of Southeast Asia, and the Proto-Mongoloid. And this was already a melting pot. The land called America was already a melting pot of melanated people from various parts of the globe long before pale-skinned people even came on the planet. The genes that control pigmentation, hair color, eye color, SLC2485, SLC4582, HERT2, OCA2, uh, MCR1, those genes did not begin to mutate to create pale people until roughly in the area between eight to 10,000 years ago. Prior to that, light skin and pale people didn't exist. Mutations hadn't happened in the genes yet. You can find this information uh, through Dr. Keith Chang, Keith Chang, a geneticist at Keith Chang, Chang, C-H-A-N-G. Oh, Chang, okay. Yeah at University of Pitt, Pitt University up there in Pennsylvania, and Dr. Luigi Luca Cavalli Sforza, a geneticist, uh, Emeritus at Stanford University. And they tell you this in, this, in, in, in their outlay of uh, genetics and their mutation. Prior to that, they didn't exist. Yeah. So this land was already a melting pot of, once again, the paleo, quote, unquote, and this is just for scientific purposes, the paleo-American Negroid that looked like you and I today, the Australoid that looked like the Australian Aborigine, the Austronesian, which looks like the Melanesians and the people of Fiji and the Pop ones, the Papua New Guinea, uh, and uh, the Southeast Asian, uh, what they call the Negritos, i.e., little blacks. Now, once again, me dialoguing with y'all, this is not in law. This is just common vernacular, us speaking amongst each other. So I know what black means. Black means death, but this is just common vernacular. Mm-hmm. Uh, the people like uh, the Orangasli Mele, the Jarawa, the Jarawa have been living on the, uh, the Andaman Islands have been living there for like 60,000 years in the uh, Indian Ocean. And you can look them up as well as the Jarawa. And the, uh, there's another group of people I can't think of their name, but uh, they're so territorial that if you, it's, it's, uh, it's against international law to even go to their island because they'll kill you. But they stay up in the Indian Ocean, too. All of these people, man, are super, super, super dark. Uh, the Mons of Southeast Asia, i.e. Cambodia, Laos, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, uh, Thailand, uh, the little black people there, and uh, the next group of people, the Northeastern, uh, Siberian, Mongolia. Uh, Proto-Mongoloid, dark-skinned people like the Ket people and the Chukchi people. You can look these people up. The originals of them, man, dark as hell. And then you had what was called the Proto-Europoid. They came out of, like, England and Lebrana man. They came out of, like, Spain. These was dark-skinned people in Spain and both the British Isles. Super, super dark, but had naturally blue eyes. 
interesting. That's when the mutations started. Now, slowly when the mutations started to come in through those groups of people, as well as uh, uh, the Matola Sweeten finds where the original people of Scandinavia were dark-skinned with blue eyes. So some of these people migrated to the America, coming down through the, uh, the northeastern corridor, island hopping, coming over through Iceland, through Greenland, through uh, 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 what they call today Newfoundland, uh, Nova Scotia, coming on down that eastern seaboard into Massachusetts and all of that, man, settling in Virginia as well. This stuff happened, man, and cut off around about a period of 11, maybe about 11,000, um, about 11,000, 10,000 years ago. And this land was already a melting pot of melanated people. So how we got these various markers in our DNA is through genetic admixture, what they call introgression. Or introgression is another people coming in with new genetic information and mixing in with the previous population. The last to really mix in with us was the Europe was the Europeans. And uh you also had uh the ancient African empires coming in, such as Kemet. Kemet had come over here, as well as uh Kush. Uh through the cocaine mummies. They found some mummies, hundred and thirty four mummies over there in Kemet with cocaine and tobacco in their system. And both of those plants are indigenous to the Americas. They found corn in Nigeria. Corn is indigenous to the Americas. That when once excavated, corn was found at a level that's older than the city of Ileife, the city of the Orishas, over there in Nigeria. So it shows an ancient American slash African con- connection going back and forth for thousands of years. So when you tell this archaeology, anthropology, uh, 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 genetic studies uh, into this thing, cranial morphology, and even the study of the teeth. Uh, you find out, man, where these connections came from, not only that, where they have gone. Because how is it, like I said, that the Igbo people, Nigeria, have shovel teeth, and only one other group thus far in Ghana have shovel teeth, but none of the other people in Africa, man, or none of the other groups in Africa are known to have it, which means that some of us left the Americas thousands of years ago and migrated over there. Now, around about twelve to 13,000 years ago, there was a comet that struck uh, around about the area of South Carolina, northeastern Georgia, and uh, it was so powerful that it basically made a lot of the land in North America uninhabitable. And the effects of the comet uh, were found all the way down there in Antarctica. And what it did was it caused it caused such a climactic effect that it created what was called dry ass periods, dry ass, D-R-Y-A-S. And what these dry ass periods are known for is creating many ice ages, small ice ages. So at the time, when the Mongoloids did come over here, after the Ice Age had received my bad, Hello? y'all. Yeah, my, my bad. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> That's my fault. Okay. When the Ice Age did begin to recede, and the northeastern Siberian slash total Mongoloid was able to come down into the Americas. It was before the comet had struck. And then when the comet had struck, uh, a lot of us had to leave. And we actually went further down south, like southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, all of that, going down into South America. And some of us even left and went to Africa. That's how the Igbo people got that as well as that other, uh, that other group in, in Ghana. You know, they put the genetic traits over there. So it's a very interesting history, man. There's a lot to be told from genetics, archaeology, and uh, anthropology. So next question.
Okay. Uh, gave the, the rundown on the genetics and the anthropology and everything. Uh, can you touch on a very sensitive subject of how the Moors want to differentiate between when I say well, when I when I'm saying it this way, when we're going against each other, saying we're different from one another, when we have an example of somebody that looked like us come over and next the land into the empire. Can you can you touch on that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna start at the annexation first. Okay. Okay. All right. Now we do know that. Medunetia has been found, you know, pretty much all over, man. The Grand Canyon. Uh, they even said it was found as far as Australia, which showed you that uh, at one point in time, certain period of time, man, Egyptians was all over the place. But the greatest uh, seafarers ever known as far as trade and commerce were those people known as, i.e., the Canaanites, who became known as the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians are the ones that set up Carthage, or Carthadash, as it's known as in uh, Medonetch, Carthadash, and, and Canaanite as well. Medonetch and Canaanite is pretty much very similar. Later on, they went on to spread into the uh, Iberian Peninsula, known as uh, Ibidia or land of the Ebre, which is another name for Hebrew. There's plenty of writing over there, man, what they call Paleo-Hebrew, Canaanite. Uh, they also known as Tunic, they also call it Tunic Iberian. And uh, Tunic Iberia became a territory of Carthage. Around about 500 B.C., there was a Carthaginian king, sea king, and his name was Hanno. Hanno the Navigator. Hanno the Navigator had sailed to America, and he had placed a stone in Kamasakum County, Cape Cod Bay, Massachusetts, called the Bourne Stone today, known as the Bourne Stone. But there was Tunic Iberian script on the stone, and it said, a proclamation of annexation. Do not deface. With this, Hanno takes possession. And basically, he landmarked the land and annexed the entire Americas to the Carthaginian Empire in the East. Now, not only was there stones of Punic Iberian writing there, they found one in Rhode Island called, I think it's in Rhode Island, or it might be in Massachusetts, called the Apuxit Stone. Prior to that, in 800 B.C., there was a stone placed here by the Carthaginians' ancestors, and it's right next door in uh, Oklahoma. And it's known as the, uh, the Pontotox Dele. And it talks about uh, Baal or Baal, uh, Baal Rock or Baal Rock, you know, the God of the Son, and it's very similar to, I think it's Psalms 102 or 104 in the Bible, was written on the Pontotox Dele. Further up the Mississippi River, further up north, traveling on the Mississippi River, there was one called the Davenport Dele that was found in a burial mound, and it had the, uh, the rites of Osiris on that stone. It was found in 1874. It had the uh, opening of the mouth ceremony. And uh, you had Tunic Iberian script, a Phoenician script, found down in Uruguay. So it was traveling all over this land and landmark. So that's how the land is annexed to the empire under what they call Yah's law, or the laws of the scriptures in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 14 Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 17, Proverbs 22, verse 28, Proverbs 23, 10. Uh, I think it's 
Hosea chapter Hosea, the book of Hosea, chapter five, verse ten. Y'all can go look those up. They deal with landmarks. Don't quote me on the last one, but I think it's Jose chapter five, verse ten. Okay? And all of them talk about landmarks, and once the land is marked, it's set up for the inheritance of a people or someone. And so it tells you that if you move the landmarks, then the most high is going to move you. So as far as us being Moors, you know, or back then there wasn't Moors, it's M O O R S. It was Mari, M A U R E, or Moro, M A U R O. Yes, we are Moors underneath the ancient land claim. But as the Empress taught us, Empress Bariasi, we are actually Moors from the ancient land of Mu. Mu was in the Pacific. And we are the ones known as the mound builders. So are we both Moors, are we both Moors, Moros, or Moor and Moors? The blood has been tired so much that we're both. You are what your ancestors were. You can't separate your ancestors genetically. You are the composite of the up to date. So you have what's known as two types of title. You have ancient aboriginal title coursing through your vein. Why? Because the law teaches maxims of law, Bouvier's Dictionary of Law, 1856, maxims of law, Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition revised, 1968. You can go and look these up. One maxim says, land lying unoccupied is given to the first occupant. And it says, what land belongs to no one, by natural reason, belongs to the first occupant. And there's another one that says, uh, what belongs to no one is given to the first occupant. There's another maxim of law that says, the air is one and the same with the air test. There's another maxim of law that says what is first is true, and what is first in time is better in, better in law. There's another maxim of law that says monuments, which we call records, are vestiges of truth in antiquity. These are maxims of law. Yeah. And so far, what you have demonstrated is the evidence from the archaeology, the bones, how it tied into genetics, and you just touched on the ancient land claim, which tied back into the blood, because you can't separate it once it's already been mixed, and you tied us into the law. So that's really safe to say. In, in 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 layman terms, like I like to say sometimes, if you 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 have children, right? And mm-hmm. now let, let let's say this man has children, and the ones in the house with him all got his name, right? But but then when something happened to him or whatever, it's another one that just show up that ain't nobody sure about, and you want some of what the house children got. Right. What do you got to do? By you right make sure that blood. Yeah. yeah exactly. mm-hmm. yep. Right of blood. And I, we got you just for a few more minutes. Can you touch on your 10, uh, 10 or 11? Can you touch on that? Because I, I, I've explained it to them best as I could. Mm-hmm. But can, can you run through it and then uh, – Really touch on that 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 state level with the two ounces and that federal level with the twenty two. Yeah, I got you, family. Uh, okay. I have a, a process that's on my website, and uh, we've been using it for a while now. And basically, what it what it does is it's designed for you, man, to correct the status in accordance with the rights of blood and your uh, air state, your airship by blood to this land and uh to protect yourself from these uh these 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 rogue entities known as the states of and the united states 
And first, what you do is you do DNA. The reason why you do DNA for all that I just explained prior to that. Uh, then you send it off to various groups of people just to give them notice. And uh, you can either file it after they've been given notice then or you can wait until you do your bond. Your bonds are designed to protect you, man, from the from the the political fraud that they set up under the 14th Amendment, which was never ratified, and that's how they stole your estate from you, through the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment, you can own nothing, can own anything. Why? Because slaves have no rights. Property cannot own property. And not only that, it is designed to keep you a perpetual debt slave, the 14th Amendment is, until you die. Now, once you put these bonds in the various places, you know, at the state level and the federal level, all you got to do is just give them notice. If they keep it more than a certain length of time and the time is written in the bond, then it's already deemed as accepted. And not only that, the bond is submitted under equity because of UCC 1-103. Equity looks as uh, that which should be done as already having been done. So they got to come back and refute the bond under affirmation of penalties of perjury, which they're not going to do. And once you put your bonds in the places and you secure your assets via UCC and their obligation to perform underneath that, then what you do is you go and get congressional records. That's the last part of the process that Brother uh, Terry and is talking about that I got on my site. So... You want to get the records pertaining to the United States bankruptcy. You want them always under seal, underneath the congressional seal. Why? Because that means that they got to argue with their own shit. That's their word. And I don't think they're going to do that because it's coming from the archive sealed. All right? There's records dealing with the, uh, the 14th Amendment fraud. The Georgia State Archives has a record. Library of Congress has a record. The bankruptcy, congressional records. Library of Congress has those records. Uh, the United States overthrowing a republic to become a, a democracy and pulling a coup d'etat. You know, uh, Library of Congress has those records as well. And you want all of these records to show and prove the fraud. Even with the Federal Reserve being bankrupt and the Treasury being bankrupt, uh, Library of Congress has those records. Now, as far as... Uh, the National Archives, you want to get the treaty, Treaty of Peace and Friendship, 1836 and 1787, as well as the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Why do you want the treaty? Because the treaty is made for Moors. Because Morocco was the inheritor of the Carthaginian Empire. They came out of the Carthaginian Empire. Morocco did. So, therefore, they're the former uh, inheritors or possessors of the use solely title, okay? And the Constitution says treaties are the supreme law of the land, okay? So that's the reason why you want that. And the foundation, like I said, all circulates around your blood birthright of who you are. And then the steps there afterwards, you take to secure your position. And that's it. So does that directly tie into uh, the, the, P, I mean, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship and that the land got annexed from the Carthaginian Empire? Is there another link that's needed to something more current, like maybe within no. the last couple hundred years that a tire, you know, our tribe nope. or nothing else nope. is needed? Okay. Nope, because i give you an example. We're going to take the Bible story of Jesus, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Esau, if you're a Muslim, Yeshua, if you're a Hebrew, Jesus, if you're a Christian. All right. When Jesus was born, he was born in Bethlehem, right? Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whose jurisdiction was Bethlehem under? Was it Israel's? Oh. It was Rome, wasn't it? Rome, exactly. It was Rome. Hmm. So you so leave, what was Jesus' nationality? 
Romans. Thank you. You sang when us. What was his blood? What was his, what was his? You sang when the status. Israelite. Israelite Moabite. And there you have it. It's the same over here. The land has already been claimed. The United States said in 1983, well, actually October of 1982, they declared the Bible as the word of God. 1983 was the year of the Bible. So if the law pertaining to landmark said don't you move them, don't you touch them, if you do, you're going to get cursed dead. And, the, and they say that Congress did that the Bible is the word of God, and Morocco descended out of Carthage. Who's the lawful possessor of the Usoli title? Morocco. Yeah. Thank you. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that you can find the Bible being passed in the law at United States Statutes at Large, 96 Stat 12 11. And those verses I gave you earlier, go look them up. I'll tell you about landmark. And then look up Matthew 5, 17, what Esau, Yeshua, and Jesus said about the law of Moses. He said, you're still under the law. He said, heaven and earth will pass away before anything be changed or removed from the law. So guess what? The law yesterday pertaining to landmarks is still the law today. And now it's recognized as the law. Because Congress recognized the Bible as the word of God and made a statutory law. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah that's, that's some heavy stuff, man. Up and on us today. We got a lot of homework to do. <laughs> yeah, man. I told you that one drive, boy, I was... I was sitting here looking at the Krakens while he was talking, man. It was like when he was saying that about the, the blood, and they hadn't been around probably about 12,000 years. If you do your DNA, you know, you do it through the 23 me, they'll give you mitochondrial to you. And I, the only thing I did so far, I just went through the Krakens and found my sequence. And that automatically tied me in with, with, the, with the pygmies over there in Tennessee. For about 125 to about 180,000 years. I mean, just just like that, just by looking at the mitochondria. Yeah, at the, at the <laughs> deepest excavated level, they found them in Tennessee at 40,000 years old, they present. Mm -hmm. They said they were recorded in history as being here all the way up to about 3,000 B.C. No, excuse me, not 3,000 B.C., but 1,000 B.C., which is 3,000 years ago. They said they were recording the history that, in other words, when the people came here, they saw these little people. Now, the only ones that I know of thus far to have the pygmies and their history and their oral tradition is the Cherokee. Mm -hmm. uh, they call them Young Witches Sunday. But see, here's the thing about it. This is why I tell people to be careful about calling themselves them tribe. If you record that when you got here, you saw these little people then how can you be indigenous to this land? How can the name Cherokee or the young way be indigenous to this land if you have your own tradition that you saw these people when you came here? Right. Mm -hmm. It was something foreign to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So a lot of these tribes are foreign. Now, granted, if they do their DNA, their structure probably going to look very similar more to mine. But the name on the young wheel, Chata, Catawba, Yamasi, Nadine, and they, Tixa, Tikasha, all these various names, I ask the tribes all the time, how old is that name up on this land? Oh, man, we've always been here. I ain't talking about that. How old is that name up on this land? Show me epigraphical evidence or evidence written in stone that a language evolved here from which that name is derived from, and they never can prove it. <clears throat> when I compare it to the pygmy skulls, I say, show me. They never can prove it. So what you're saying is you can really tie up your own claim 
by using that name, not because you're not necessarily that, but because that particular name went old enough to be here according to your D- how old your DNA might be. And the archaeology and the anthropology, exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why I tried to tell uh, old hard-head-ass Nitty, but she didn't want to listen. And ain't got no blood on the table. Even if you go to Article 28, Section 2, in the Organization of American State, American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, it talks about genetic resources for establishing who you are. Even if you go to Article 31 in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, it tells you about genetic evidence for establishing who you are. Why would two international bodies speak on behalf of indigenous people and include genetics in both documents? Because it's irrefutable evidence. That's right. In, in law, genetics is known as incontrovertible evidence. What, what's that evidence rule you be saying, federal evidence rule 702? Yeah, Federal Rules of Evidence, 702. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, sir. Federal Rules of Evidence, 702. Okay. Wow, man. So that 20, so I know Tara Moon, you went to uh, the 23 and Me. How much did that cost you? Mm-hmm. I got uh, it for a hundred dollars. Yeah, one hundred. Yeah, the man on the back like one hundred eight dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, one hundred eight. Okay. But, but what you really want is the genetic information so you can use that to tie you into yeah whatever genetic sequence uh, you, you derive from in in this land or yeah. You want the single okay. nucleotide polymorphism. That's what you're looking for, which leads to ancestry informing and marker. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm about to do that when I get paid, man. <laughs> yeah. The uh, Rule 702 testimony by expert witnesses. A witness who is qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education may testify in the form of an opinion or otherwise if a <clears throat> the expert scientific technical or other specialized knowledge will help the tier excuse me will help the trier of fact to understand the evidence or to determine a fact and issue b the testimony is based on sufficient facts or data c the testimony is a product of reliable principles and methods and D, the expert has reliably applied the principles and methods to the facts of the case. Mm. The brother has a, basically an in-house geneticist. So just like you see on the, you see on TV on Matlock and all that kind of stuff, when they really want to lock somebody up, they bring a psychiatrist in there to see if the joker was crazy or not, and they cope through this testimony. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. So uh, we might have to call in Toriano, man, to speak on our mm-hmm. behalf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, my uh, my uh, uh, teacher who took me under his wing, he started teaching me genetics five years ago, a uh, mm-hmm. well, little old five years ago, the brother named Tyrone Cannon. He's our genetics. Yeah, he's uh he studied genetics at the University of Perth. He took courses in genetics. Not only that, he's a championship dog breeder. So he has to know about genetic origins, the lineages of the dog, all that type of stuff. You know, they break it down what what, what species it has, because every animal has poly uh, polymorphism. All mammals do. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, and not only that. The sub-Saharan African ancestry that shows up on the gene is actually Paleo-American Negroid ancestry, you know, for lack of a better term. 
because none of the genetic sequences may have exact matches for the various groups that they that they have test uh, testing for in Africa. Shows not detected, but you share ancestry informative markers that are very common. Uh, but the single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, which which our ancestry informative markers, we've been separated for so long that we we we're looking at us, man, being involved evolved into another group. And how I know this to be a fact because uh, there's a genetic report, a white paper from uh, one genetic institute uh, from the United States, you know, because they, they, they fund genetics heavily. And this is called the making of the mitochondrial DNA landscape. L1C is a haplogroup that's about 60,000 years old. And it has various subclads. Okay. In the genetic da- database, over a third of haplogroup L1C, mitochondrial L1C, belongs to uh, African Americans. And few of those, when compared to its African counterpart, L1C, shows any matches whatsoever. So it's something, to- something different. So at, at 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 the least, we know the African L1C and the so-called African American L1C has been separated for at least sixty thousand years. And keep in mind, L1C comes out of L1. L1 comes out of L1 through six. So L1C at at the least has been separated from its African counterpart for at least 60,000 years. But if you take into account its ancestors, it could be even older than that in regards to a separation. Mm. That's a haplogroup. Yep. Yeah, mitochondria. So, so I hope uh, I was able to answer, answer y'all questions and curiosity. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I wanted to throw in one more thing I was kind of curious about um, because, you know, the the lands of the earth, I guess, millions of years ago was was this one piece of, is like a giant landmass, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Do you know anything about uh, people migrating from, oh, I don't, you know, I guess I'm trying to tie in Africa and North America and South America because it looked like, South America was kind of attached to to what they're calling Africa today. So they're saying the last time it was connected, uh, geological wise, through geological mm-hmm. studies, was about two hundred and fifty million years ago. Now they have found archaeological artifacts, what they call oops, out of place artifacts, mm-hmm. that are like a hammer that they found, I think, in Lebanon, Texas, or Palestine, Texas, something like that. The hammer was half a billion years old. They found the skull up in the uh, up in Pennsylvania buried in the coal strata. Now, you know, it takes coal millions of years to form. The skull was roughly about 280 million years old, something like that. So, uh, wow. yeah, so like I said, there's a lot of things you know, that uh that can be brought forward, but when you're going in under Rule 702, you want to have your concrete science to it to bring it forward. But, yeah, there was human habitation, you know, and uh, uh, there was migrating back and forth. You know, there was human habitation on the planet that old, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. You know, because uh, Dr. York always talked about that, you know, that people basically... Yeah. Was don't, on both sides of the continent wrong. when it separated. Yeah, I I I I remember Doctor York back in the eighties, man. You know, mm-hmm. my old dad thought I, I took my shahada when it was answer to Allah, but as he started to change and evolve things, man. You want to hear the thing? You just can't say things when you're dealing in law. You have to prove everything you say. You follow mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. In other words, to say it without proof, it has no merit. You know, 
for Dr. York to be saying these things, and then you got to keep in mind, he was reading a lot of other people's books and just translating it into, now this was back in the 90s, this I know for a fact. He was reading a lot of people's information, and basically, man, you know, I may not want to hear this, but he was plagiarizing for stuff too. He's a fact. Books that was already out there, you know, and bringing it to our people, a lot of us didn't know any better, you know, in a sense where it was digestible to us, but you never cited your source. You got to cite your source, you know. So this is where the cleanup, this is where the cleanup begins, whereas now you got to learn the sources of this information. And that way, if you have to use it in a court of, well, it's not, no such thing as a court of law because all this shit is a corporation, but in a so-called court of law, now you can bring forth the statement bagged by the fact. You follow what I'm saying? That's why they have what's called the rules of evidence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. And yeah, yeah, we're familiar. Well, I don't, I don't know if Doctor York plagiarized, but I am familiar that he did read a lot of other. Everybody in the line is pretty familiar with him bringing stuff together to present to the people. But if he, listen to me, if you don't cite the source and you're saying the same thing that somebody previously published, that's called plagiarism. You gotta cite the source, man. You have to cite your source. Otherwise, it could be discredited because you're not the author of that source. This is right. just the way the law works. I get that too. I get that too. Yeah, if he did, he should have a bibliography where he's stating his re- references uh, to where he's getting information. Some of the scrolls do have a bibliography in them. Not enough of them, though. Mm-hmm. Exactly. There's a lot, man, that has information that's not cited, and that's that's what. Although his, his, how should I say, his relating the information to you could be true, but if it's ever called up on for evidence in a court of law, if the source is not cited, they can discredit it. You see what I'm saying? This is what we're dealing with. Although we know they roll, we know the Europeans roll, we know all that stuff, we still have to be in honor. We have to be in honor. Absolutely. The more you're in honor, the more that you are in honor, the better your chances are for winning your case, whatever that may be. Mm-hmm. All right, all right. Hey, that was a lot of good stuff today, uh, Brother Toriano. Hey, I, I thank you for coming on the conference call, man. It's a it's an eye opener. Oh, man, not a problem, man. I thank Brother Terry for inviting me. I got a lot of stuff, man, in the OneDrive, you know, uh, in the archaeology anthropology folder. Y'all, man, feel free to go through it. I got uh, a lot of stuff in the historical readings and other documents folder. Feel free to go through it, man, you know, and uh, in the law and related matters folder, too. But I got a lot of stuff. It's almost 60 gigs of information on that drive, so. Y'all just, man, feel free to go through it, man. It's there for y'all to use and study. Okay, okay. Damn, 60 gigs, man. That's a lot of information. I told told you it was heavy. I told you it was heavy. (laughs) Yeah, man, there's a lot of documents. Yeah, there's a lot of documents, bro. Yeah. Yeah, that's for y'all, man. I did that for my people. Okay, well, we appreciate your hard work. Oh, man, no problem. Thank you for your appreciation, man. Man, Brother Terry, thank you for having me once again, brother. Hey, man, hey, it's all love, bro. Like, I, I tell anybody, I've been trying to decipher this stuff for about since, like, 2012. But when mm-hmm. I seen yours, it started to bring it all, it, it started making everything make sense because – even if you don't know a whole lot about it, you can kind of know when you see something that makes sense. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And for the way my mind work and the way these brothers' mind work on this call, man, they can't argue with themselves. At, at, the, at the very least, they can try to argue with themselves, but I doubt they will. 
And on the other hand, if they don't say that the Bible is the word of God and they don't put it in the law, according to nature's law and, and, and natural law, man, they just going to be outside of honor. That's right. And that make it work for us. That's right. That's and right. that's the way... That, it, 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 it ain't by me looking at it. How you how how it's in the one drive? This this is first page. You leave them nothing to argue about. Nothing. No. Nope. Nothing. I take my hat off to you, man. Cause man, thank I, you, man. I, I told you that morning, man. Like I, I I'm sure I got I got a few more grades in my beard. But me and these brothers will be trying to go through the scroll. We'll be trying to, I'll be trying to read to OneDrive. I'm trying to look at Prince, all of us trying to read Prince Uriel Bay book. Man, sh-